Hello and welcome to this new episode of Not So Fast. In this video, what we are going to discuss is the is just a theory um, argument. And in particular, we are going to give a historical um, outlook on this particular argument, which is quite contrasting with some of the videos which have been made on the topic um, in the past few years. Now, let's have a look uh, at, the, at some context first. So let's uh, imagine that we've got two interlocutors, A and B, and they are um, arguing with each other about a certain topic. Now, person A is, let's say, going to push forward a metaphysical narrative, A. Now, what I mean by metaphysical narrative is that this particular discourse is going to uh, make statements about what makes up the world, then uh, how the world works, and it may also contain some political ideology mixed in with these uh, metaphysical features. Now, on top of this, of course, person B is going to disagree and they are going to push a, a different narrative called narrative B and disagreeing with narrative A. Now, this narrative B is equally uh, metaphysical and will comprise the same things about, uh, I mean, not the same statement, but the same nature of the statements on what makes up the world, how it works, and may be colored with political ideology as well. Now, at some point in the discussion, let's say person A comes and say, but science. And here, this is just a shorthand for essentially that science would be supporting narrative A, and therefore person B has a duty to believe uh, in narrative A and actually um, act accordingly. Now, the thing is that um, person B instead just says, it's just a theory. So there you go. That's how you set up the context for the appearance of this particular argument. Now, very well-made videos have been made in the last four or five years, and I'm going to uh, put uh, in the description below uh, some links to these videos. And I really encourage you to have a look at them and, you know, uh, and appreciate uh, or look critically the kind of things that these videos are saying. Um, as I said earlier, what we are going to look at in this particular video is more a historical outlook to basically show that the question or the argument itself is not as easy to brush off um, as it sounds. And the reason why is because it could actually be helpful and have been helpful for science to move forward. So I'm going to present three examples of uh, instances where this has happened. Um, um, and, and then we are going to conclude on this. First example that we are going to look at is that of Nicholas Copernicus. Now, during his lifetime, he actually advocated for a view which was a heliocentric view, where planets would be orbiting the sun, which would be sitting at the center of the universe. So in blue here, you've got uh, the Earth and in red, Mars. I'm not going to represent more planets than that just because I do not want to crowd uh, the video. So this view was actually in opposition with another orthodox view uh, and very well established one, which was that of Ptolemy. Now, the Ptolemaic view was that um, the Earth was sitting at the center of the universe and then you would have the Sun orbiting around the Earth and then Mars, for example, would be orbiting uh, let's say, along a small circle, and the small circle itself would be orbiting the Earth. Now, if you were to, uh, you know, draw an x-axis that means the proximity to modern view, then uh, you would rank these uh, two views uh, roughly uh, about there. Now, if instead you also try to look at what was the agreement with data in the 16th century, um, after Christ, then you would get something a little bit different. So what happened here is that the Ptolemaic model was much better at, uh, you know, agreeing with data as was the Copernican model. But of course, Coperni uh, Copernicus had many other reasons to believe that his model was a correct one and was a metaphysically correct one. So what did he say then? Well, basically, he, uh, he agreed that the uh, Ptolemaic model was, uh, you know, fitting very well with observations and so on. 
But when it comes to the reality of things, he basically stated, well, it's just a theory. And in some sense, I'm allowed to think about other ways of representing the world. Uh, now, let's have a go at example number two. So, um, this example concerns um, Albert Einstein and one of the papers that he published in 1905. Now, uh, if you take a, a light torch and you simply switch it on, then you're going to have some light shining from it. Now, what uh, Albert Einstein proposed in this paper of 1905 was that, in fact, uh, this light was made of particles. Now, why did Einstein actually propose something like this? Well, that was to justify uh, what was happening in the so-called photoelectric effect. If you take the best model that people had at the time of atoms, then this was called the plum pudding model. So in this model, you would have electrons, which are actual particles that are either sitting at some set place or maybe moving around in a neutralizing positively charged background. And uh, here Einstein said, well, if we imagine that light is made of particles then this particle of light can come in and kick out an electron from an atom. And this could actually explain, you know, to some extent quantitatively what was going on with the photoelectric effect. Now, the problem with this picture is that although it seems to be able to explain what is going on for this very specific phenomenon, it turned out that it was in total contradiction with Maxwell's wave theory of light, which stated that light was an electromagnetic wave. And in fact, Einstein uh, himself says in the paper, again, it's going to be put in the description, notwithstanding the complete experimental verification. So here, please notice the complete experimental verification of the wave theory of diffraction, reflection, refraction, dispersion, and so on. It is quite conceivable that a theory of light involving the use of continuous function in space will lead to contradictions with experience if it is applied to the phenomena of the creation and conversion of light. Now, you need to appreciate as well that here Einstein doesn't have at all a complete theory of how light could be made of particles and, for example, could explain diffraction, reflection, refraction, dispersion, etc. So that's why it's, it was entirely in opposition to it and on top of this uh, was trying to explain a very niche phenomenon as well. So it was uh, not at all uh, obvious that this particular position had to be embraced. Um, and in fact, that's not the case. Some people agreed with it, but many others actually didn't because it was contradicting a very, very well-established theory. But again, in this piece of text, what Einstein is saying is that, yes, this particular wave theory is working very, very, very well, and it has been incredibly, uh, incredibly well-established, but it's just a theory. And essentially, please allow me to think otherwise and to think of different scenarios about what the world and what light is actually made of. Now, let's have a go at the third example. This involves the material scientist Dan Schechtman. And what he actually discussed was something related to crystal structures. So the common like standard model of crystals that had been uh, going on for easily, uh, you know, a century or so uh, was that um, you've got basically a so-called unit cell. And I'm representing here the atoms in green, which are sitting on the vertices of that unit cell. Now, for simplicity, I'm using a unit cell, which is a square. But of course, there are various different shapes that can be used for unit cells. Uh, also, for simplicity, I'm using a two-dimensional representation, but obviously three-dimensional uh, representation exists as well. Now, once you have this particular unit cell, the standard model of crystalline structures claims that this, uh, this uh, cell is going to be repeated uh, so that it fills the entirety of space. Now, there are multiple features that such structures actually have. So the first one is that if you were to take this region of the lattice and then you translate it by an integral number of this lattice spacing, uh, for example, to go here, then you get the exact same picture. 
So this particular property uh, in mathematics is called an invariant by translation. Now, another property that this particular structure has is that if I were to rotate it by 90 degrees, then this is exactly the same structure that I get back. So this is what is called rotational invariance. And in particular here, this is invariant under rotation by 90 degrees. So this is 90 degrees, and this is 360 degrees divided by 4. Now, why do I say that? Well, because in mathematics and in crystallography, the way people characterize this particular uh, invariance is by saying that there is a fourfold rotational symmetry. Okay, so fourfold because it's 360 degrees divided by 4. Now, it turns out that there is a very powerful theorem due to Bravais, which is called the restriction theorem. And essentially, it says that for the structures that we have described, uh, there can only be um, the two, three, four, and six fold rotation symmetry. You can't have, for example, five, eight, nine, etc. So in three dimensions, you can't have uh, uh, any other rotation symmetry for these kind of structures than two, three, four, and six. Now, this was the actual orthodoxy when Sheshman in 1982 was studying some specific metal alloys. And when he actually looked at them, the kind of structure he got uh, from uh, his uh, experimental data was something that was reminiscent of what were uh, called Penrose tilings. Now, Penrose tilings, I'm not going to enter into any details, are essentially filling of space which are not regular. Or here, it's more in the sense that there, there is no uh, translation periodicity that can be uh, found anywhere in the pattern, even if you were to continue it to infinity. Now, um, it turns out that this uh, particular figure, uh, again, that's what is reminiscent of it. So this is not the exact same thing that uh, Sheshman actually found. Uh, but what is interesting is that if you rotate this thing by 72 degrees, you get the very same picture you started with. So here, remember that uh, 72 degrees is equal to 360 divided by 5. So what it tells us is that uh, Sheshman had found a five-fold symmetry crystal. So that's the kind of thing that he looked at. Now, because there was a lack of translation symmetry, uh, because this is a Penrose kind of tiling, then um, Cheshman suggested that this could be called quasi-crystals. And again, this is from looking at experimental data, which doesn't, look, which doesn't tell you directly the answer about how the atoms are actually put in place. This is what is called an X-ray uh, scattering pattern, uh, and then somehow you need to infer the structure from it. So there is a bit of thinking behind it about what is a real interpretation about the signal you are, you are actually observing. Now, Sheshman was persuaded that this was a five-fold symmetry structure, which was on top of this aperiodic. Uh, but how do you think people reacted to this? Well, um, as Sheshman explains um, himself, well, people just laughed at him. And in particular, there is this line from Linus Pauling, who uh, has been awarded two uh, Nobel Prize, and where he said that there is no such thing as quasi-crystals, only quasi-scientists. Now, in spite of these things, because um, Sheshman believed uh, that his particular interpretation of the data he was observing was correct, he essentially allowed himself to say, well, no, this is just a theory, this idea that we can't have crystals which have uh, five-fold symmetry or eight-fold symmetry and so on. Eventually, his hard work and resilience paid off, and he actually earned the Nobel Prize for his discovery in uh, 2011. So where does that leave us? Well, we've seen three examples uh, in the history of science where the um, innovators, if you will, um, they've um, had to, at some point, say, at the very least to themselves, is just a theory 
about very well established theories, uh, arguments, and metaphysics. Now, you could even say that it's just a theory is to some extent a prerequisite in order to be in the proper mindset so as to develop new ideas and imagine new pathways and avenues uh, to explore to move forward on a given niche problem, maybe initially, but then that can revolutionize the entirety of the field. Um, so that's it for the video for today. If you would be interesting in interested in knowing about more examples like this one, please let me know. I would be happy to do a number two video on this. If you would like me to comment, uh, for example, on some of the videos I'm going to put in description on uh, why um, scientific theories should be uh, uh, immune to this is just a theory argument, then please let me know as well in the comment section below. Uh, and on this then, uh, see you in the next episode.